Hello everyone. It's time to continue reading the little booklet by Theophil Christen called The Alternative to Capitalism and Socialism. This is part five of the readings. Page 24. The International Exchanges. It is highly desirable that a country, as well as having a stable currency, a fixed level of internal prices, should also enjoy stable rates of exchange between its currency and the currencies of other countries. This is especially important for a country with a large foreign trade. It is highly desirable that a country, as well as having a stable currency, a fixed level of internal prices should also enjoy stable rates of exchange between its currency and the currencies of other countries. This is especially important for a country with a large foreign trade, like the United States. Before the war, the rates of exchange between the various countries were stable, and this stability of the international exchanges was erroneously attributed to some characteristic of gold. But in reality, the rates of exchange were stable, not because all countries had gold currencies, but because they had the same currency. Gold, having been declared legal tender in all countries, flowed freely from one country to another and served as an international medium of payment. Gold did not stabilize internal prices in any country. It did not prevent great fluctuations of prices, but it made these fluctuations occur simultaneously in all countries. For if prices tended to rise disproportionately in any country, there was an outflow of gold and a slight fall of prices in that country and a slight rise of prices in all the other countries. Prices therefore changed proportionately in all countries and this automatically stabilized the rates of exchange between them. Stabilization of the exchanges was not due to any inherent characteristic of gold but simply to the fact that all countries having adopted the same standard had in effect an international form of currency. The exchanges would also have been stable if all countries had adopted a silver, copper, iron, or cowrie shell standard. While in gold standard countries, the proportionate fluctuations of the price levels result in the stabilization of the rate of exchange of gold only, the rate of exchange between two countries with stabilized price levels by means of freed money represents the ratio of their stabilized price levels. While in gold standard countries, the proportionate fluctuations of the price levels result in the stabilization of the rate of exchange of gold only, the rate of exchange between two countries with stabilized price levels by means of freed money represents the ratio of their stabilized price levels. This ratio tends naturally to stability and is only influenced by the trade balances according to the law of supply and demand. But just as the fluctuation of the price of a single commodity in a country with stabilized price level automatically and exactly regulates production of that particular commodity. Out of self-interest of both producer and consumer, so every fluctuation of the rate of exchange between two countries with stabilized price levels will tend to automatically balance supply and demand by either stimulating or inhibiting exportation, as the case may be. Thus, free economy also solves perfectly the problem of international exchanges. Stabilization of the rates of exchange between countries adopting freed money 
could also be attained by the issue of a small amount of international paper money under the joint control of the countries interested. These countries would then enjoy the double advantage of stable rates of exchange and stable internal prices. Government credit. It may be asked, what of government credit if money constantly depreciates? But if the government repays its loans and money with a fixed purchasing power, its credit must be greater than at present when it constantly defrauds its creditors. How many trust securities, consoles, for example, have sunk in value from year to year simply because the general rate of interest has risen? And apart from this, the money lent to the government has generally lost appreciably in purchasing power when the time comes for repayment. With the stabilization of the currency, such losses are impossible. But we go further and advocate the conversion of all government debts into securities kept constantly at par, that is, into securities with a varying rate of interest adjusted so as to keep the market price of the securities constantly at 100. This brings a series of important advantages. First, such securities can never be misused for speculation, which is just and right, for they are savings, and savings ought to have a fixed value, in contrast to the current tokens of money, which ought to be circulated, not saved. Secondly, with government securities kept constantly at par, the urgent necessary repayment of the national debt becomes much easier. For when under the influence of currency stabilization and freed money, the general rate of interest falls, the rate of interest on the government securities must also be lowered. Otherwise, the securities would rise above par. What the government saves in interest can be used for paying off the national debt. And how can a debtor gain better credit than by rapid repayment of his debt? Land tenure. One socialistic principle seems amply justified, namely state ownership of monopolies. By a, by a monopoly, we mean here a business by its nature without competition, not a business in which competition has been artificially excluded as is the case, for example, with the state monopoly, monopoly of tobacco. In socialistic literature, least is said, strangely enough, of the most important of all monopolies, the monopoly of the land, including mineral wealth and water power. Probably because up to the present, no socialist has been able to explain how, in practice, the land can be nationalized. Land, by which we also understand all natural resources, oil, coal, ore, water power, etc., is the source of all wealth. Land is the gift of nature, and as such cannot be increased. This source of all wealth cannot be left in the hands of a few with the exclusion of all others and to whom access is only allowed for payment of high profit. The earth was given to all of us as its birthright. While free economy safeguards private property by establishing economic stability and sanctifies it by letting it flow from work only, it must reject private ownership of the source of all wealth, land, whereby it is made an object of speculation and exploitation. For us, the problem is simple. The state buys the whole of the nation's land, calculating the purchase price on the basis of the present rental capitalized at the market rate of interest. The state pays this price in stock, 
constantly kept at par, that is, in the best and safest possible form of security, which has always a market value of 100 on the stock exchange. The land is then parceled and let to the highest bidders. Farming land on long leases, hereditary leases, to prevent to prevent exhaustion of the soil by short-term tenants. This is an example of the bond for land. From this plan, the state at first obtains no financial advantage, since the amount it receives as rent must be paid over to the holders of the land stock. But the whole future increase in the value of the land falls to the state, and it will be very great. For all the advantage of trade stability due to stabilization of the currency and freed money will be automatically converted into increased rent on land. The general rate of interest, on the contrary, falls, so the amount of interest on the land stock steadily decreases, and the state sees its income increasing and its expenditure decreasing. The balance serves at first to repay the whole rent on the land. When this has been redeemed, the whole rent on the nation's land is at the disposable is at the disposal of the government. This sum is, in most countries, larger than all the taxes added together, a fact which gives some measure of the relief to the hard-pressed state resulting from this reform. When the land debt is repaid, the land is free. Rent on land no longer benefits a small class of privileged individuals but the community as a whole. If the land were not, were not nationalized, all the advantages of currency stabilization and freed money, which ought to fall to the workers, would be pocketed by the private landowners who would offer their tenants the cynical alternative. Either enjoy the increased advantages of a home in this prosperous state and pay for them in the shape of an increased rent or emigrate. The freed land reform can also be brought about in a gradual evolutionary way if the people desire so. The community, state, or federal government is granted the purchasing right. The community, state, or federal government is granted the purchasing right. The sale of the land to a speculator would endanger the economic existence of the future owner and put him into disadvantage with others who acquire their land at low price. This dilemma can only be solved by granting the right of the purchase to the community or state or federal government in case of sale. This dilemma can only be solved by granting the right of purchase to the community or state or federal government in case of sale. In this way, all Mother Earth would again gradually go into ownership of her children. The natural condition that land is nobody's private property would at last be restored in an organic process by the same, although reverse process by which the previous natural condition prevailing under the ancient Anglo-Saxon law had gradually been eliminated by the Roman law. The natural condition that land is nobody's private property would at last be restored in an organic process by the same although reverse process by which the previous natural condition prevailing under the ancient Anglo-Saxon law had gradually, been, had gradually been eliminated by the Roman law. For thousands of years, this free land principle had proved a blessing to the individual and the race. 
There are still today families in Europe existing who, under the domain, state, lease right, could weather the economic storms of a thousand years, while the private ownership of land leads automatically to indebtedness, to economic and racial annihilation. Without pity, the violation of natural economic law penalizes the violator. violator. The freed land reform can also be brought about in a gradual evolutionary way if the people desire so. The community, state, or federal government is granted the purchasing right. The sale of the land to a speculator would endanger the economic existence of the future owner and put him into disadvantage with others who acquired their land at low price. This dilemma can only be solved by granting the right of purchase to the community or state or federal government in case of sale. In this way, all Mother Earth would again gradually go into ownership of all her children. The natural condition that land is nobody's private property would at last be restored in an organic process by the same, although reverse, process by which the previous natural condition prevailing under the ancient Anglo-Saxon law had gradually been eliminated by the Roman law. For thousands of years, this freed land principle had proved a blessing to the individual and the race. There are still today families in Europe existing who, under the domain state lease right, could weather the economic storms of a thousand years, while the private ownership of land leads automatically to indebtedness, to economic and racial annihilation. Without pity, the violation of natural economic law penalizes the violator. A state adopting free land acts in a similar manner, for it also reaps the advantages of the new conditions in the form of higher rents. A state adopting free land acts in a similar manner, for it also re reaps the advantages of the new conditions in the form of higher rents. But whereas no one controls the use to which the private landowners put their income from rent, the freed land state will divide its rents among its citizens, perhaps in the form of a subsidy for all children under 14 paid to the children's mothers. This endowment of motherhood has much to recommend it. It is just that rent, which depends on population, should be distributed among those whom falls the burden of maintaining or increasing the population, namely the mothers. This endowment of motherhood has much to recommend it. It is just that rent, which depends on population, should be distributed among those on whom falls the burden of maintaining or increasing the population, namely the mothers. The total amount of rent on Swiss land before the war was 350 million francs. From this fund, it would be possible to pay Swiss mothers 300 to 400 francs annually for each child under 14. This payment and the general increase of wages and salaries due to the de decrease of interest would suffice to make women economically independent and would give them greater liberty to follow their natural instinct when choosing their mates. For men, also, the endowment of motherhood would mean a reduction of the risks and burdens of founding a family. For these reasons, freed land would certainly raise the standard of sexual morality and refine the relations between the sexes, as well as contributing to the welfare of the children. One other point may be mentioned. The effect of freed land on international relations. It is well known that tariff barriers and protective duties are the principal economic cause of international friction and war. But in a country which adopts freed land, no party has interest in maintaining protective duties. If, for example, the farmers of a country called for a duty on imported wheat, increased competition at the leasing of wheat land would immediately raise the rent and reduce the extra profit to zero. And if, on the other hand, the importation of cheap wheat diminished the, prop the farmer's profits, rents would fall, 
and the farmers would suffer no injury. With freed land, farmers would have nothing to gain and nothing to lose by protective duties. Again, it is a well-known historical fact that protective tariffs are only called for during periods of falling general prices, the resulting trade depression being erroneously ascribed to foreign competition, which it is proposed to exclude by means of protective tariffs. But with a stabilized currency, a general fall of prices and trade depression cannot occur, so merchants and the employers will not ask for protective duties. Tariff barriers sooner or later lead to war. Freed land which eliminates tariffs is the surest guarantee of international peace. The economic system resulting from the two reforms, freed land and freed money, is called free economy.